second fundamental theorem of calculus. Just a little reminder, here's your first fundamental. Okay, it's just the definition of the uh, definite integral, f of big f of b minus f big f of a. The second fundamental theorem of calculus says, if we of course have a continuous function, um, we can take the derivative of this integral. We know that when we take the derivative of an integral, we end up with just the, that plain old function right there. Okay, because we've gone backwards and then we've taken the derivative of it. So we just ended up right where we're at. But notice the limits right here. Okay, the bottom limit is a number. The bottom limit is a constant, A. The top number is, or the top limit is a variable, is X. Or it could be X squared, or it could be an expression, um, X cubed minus 2, or something like that. What happens is we're going to plug in that into our function, like we just did in that example. Okay, we're plugging that into our function. But we have to multiply by the derivative of whatever was up there. Okay, because we took the derivative of something, so we've got to multiply by its derivative. Okay? Um, so, it's very conceptual right now. Let's look at some examples that use this. Okay? Um, so, let's evaluate this expression right here. We've got the derivative symbol d over dx of an integral of our function here. So all we do, the derivative and the antiderivative undo each other. All we do is we plug in the x where we see t. And we multiply by the derivative of that variable that was our upper limit. Well, in this case, it's just 1. Okay. Now, I do that at this point because a lot of times it's not. So I just want to emphasize, don't forget that part. Um, so really, the, this is your answer right here, and that's it, okay, that's it. It really is that simple right now, okay? Um, now, the reason why we don't have to worry about that bottom limit, even if it weren't zero, if it were some other number, think about what would be happening here. If we took the antiderivative, okay, if we took the antiderivative and evaluated it, we would plug in the x, that would keep that to be a variable expression, then we would subtract what we get when we plug in this constant. Well, then when we turn around and take the derivative of that, we're taking the derivative of a constant. So it's going to disappear. Okay? So that's why this number right down here, as long as it's a number, it doesn't matter. Okay? As long as that's a number, it does not matter. It doesn't matter what number it is. Okay? Let's look at another one. Okay, let's look at another one. Uh, example two says integrate to find big F as a function of X. Okay, that's what we just did in that example number three from the other sheet. And then it asks us to demonstrate the second fundamental theorem of calculus by differentiating the answer you just found. Okay, so we're going to anti-differentiate then we're going un to undo it, and we're going to prove what I just said. Okay, we're going to prove that it doesn't matter what that number on the bottom is. Okay, so we're going to integrate. Okay, so big F of X is equal to, when we take the antiderivative of the square root of T, what is the result? Okay, so that's T to the one half. So, J. Mm -hmm. Okay, two-thirds t to the three-halves if we simplify it. If we go ahead and flip that denominator over, okay, we need to evaluate that from 4 to x. So plug in x, so we get two-thirds x to the three-halves minus two-thirds times 4 to the three-halves. So when we simplify, we've got 2 thirds x to the 3 halves minus, let's see here, 4 to the 3 halves. The square root of 4 is 2, 2 cubed is 8. 
So that's 16 over 3. 2 thirds times 8. 16 over 3. All right, so that is finding big F as a function of X. That's what y'all just did in that last example before we started these new ones. Then it asks us to demonstrate the second fundamental theorem of calculus by differentiating that answer we just found. So we are going to second fundamental this. We are going to take the derivative of this expression with respect to X, and we're going to see what we end up with. So when we take the derivative, uh, 2 thirds times 3 halves, guess what, that cancels. 3 halves minus 1 is 1 half. What's the derivative of 16 over 3? 0. So what do we end up with? x to the 1 half, or the square root of x, is what we get after we take the derivative. So would that not have been... The same thing, it's just plugging in x into this function and multiplying by the derivative of x, which is 1. Okay. So we just went backwards, we integrated, then we took the derivative. That's why the second fundamental theorem works the way that it does. Okay. So this was proving to you the second fundamental theorem. Am I going to ask you to do this? No. Okay. I was just showing you why it works uh, and why it does not matter what this number is. That was something other than 4. If that had been 9, okay, uh, we would have been subtracting 50 or thirds, but it doesn't matter because when we took the derivative, that would be 0. It doesn't matter. Okay, it does not matter what that constant on the block is. Okay, so example 3. Last one here. Find the derivative of this function here, okay? It's not your paper. It's okay. It's just going to a little lazy. I wanted to make the other stuff bigger, so I was like, oh, I'll sacrifice it. You didn't really need to make it I know. I know. It's okay. Well, then just put this one under it. You got it. All right. Uh, so find the derivative of an integral. You should recognize this as the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So that means I'm not changing anything, okay? I just take um, the function right there, cosine, replace its variable with the x cubed. Don't forget to multiply by the derivative of it. Here's an example where it's not just x, so we've got to multiply by 3x squared. That bottom is a constant, so we're done. Now, if you want to make it look a little bit better, yes, we always put the 3x squared in front of the cosine. And you don't necessarily have to put the parentheses around the x cubed. I like to because I think it helps you guys see that the x is cubed, not the cosine is cubed. As you all know, there's a big difference there, especially when you're talking about taking the derivative of it. Change the order of your chain rule. Um, and that's the answer. Now, uh, let me give you a couple little notes. Uh, I didn't want to do 10 million examples on this, so a couple of things that you'll run into in these textbook problems. If this is flip-flopped, if your limits are flip-flopped, and the number is on top, and the variable is on the bottom, then the variable is like the second step in your integrity. So it's going to be minus. Okay? You're going to change. Uh, you're going to change it. So if this had been, what I'm saying is, if this had been, um, if x cubed had been here on the bottom, it would be negative three x squared cosine of x cubed. Okay. It doesn't change because think about the process. We don't have to go through the process. We prove to ourselves that it works the way it works. But if you went through this blue one over here, you took the antiderivative, well, then the first part would be the constant minus what you get when you plug in the lower limit, so that's where the negative comes from. Okay, that's where the negative comes from. And if both of those were variable expressions, okay, if both of these were variables, let's say this was x and this were x squared, 
and we're taking the derivative of that. Let me put my derivative somewhere right here. Okay, then um, that would be 2x cosine of x squared minus cosine of x. Okay, you just plug in both of them. Okay, you just plug in both of them. And one of them doesn't disappear this time because one of them is not constant. Does that make sense? Okay, because you're going backwards and then you're going forwards. Um, but based on what we know, we know we can just plug them in. Easy enough, right? So, 